All right. We're, uh, we're going to be in Ezra chapters 3 and 4 today. We're going through this book. Uh, it's great to be with you here today. I just want to say a welcome to you. If you're new or first time, a special welcome to you. It's great to have you part of the family. As soon as you come through the doors, we love you and God loves you. Actually, he loves you even if you don't come through the doors. And well, we just want to encourage you today. I want, hopefully today, uh, you won't be beating yourself up as we go through the sermon like church has been oftentimes in the past, but you might see Jesus, know Jesus, and love Jesus. That's our heart. That's what we want everyone to get out of this is what's the next step that you're taking in your relationship with Jesus. Um, so I'm just going to pray, and then we're going to get started into this passage. Uh, dear Lord, we just pray especially today, uh, and just be aw- being aware that, we, Lord, we have young kids here today without our Sunday school on today. They go back next week. Uh, we just pray and bless them as they go about their day, as they get ready for school and, and go about their life again. I pray that they'll get something out of today in your word, Lord, because it has something for them in here. I pray, Lord, that for the adults and the older people, the younger people, all of us in between, Lord, that we know that the word can challenge, equip, and encourage. So I just pray, Lord, you do that, that you'll do your work, Lord, that the Bible changes lives and it changes my life. And I pray that if there's something here that can change their life as well, Lord, everybody here. So we pray all that, Lord, be faithful and good in this message today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we're in the book of Ezra, and I'm not going to go the whole recap last week, although it's not online, so you can't go back and find it, but that's how it is. And so basically we've been doing our big series in Daniel. And they're coming back to the promised land again. They've been in captivity for 70 years. Kids, have you ever been in timeout? Right? Imagine being in timeout for 70 years. All right? And so they're about to go back home. And they're, you know, they've left their, their, their new, their old, not their new or old land, but the home that they've been living in for 70 years. So some of them were born in Babylon. And now they're coming back to Jerusalem. And they're charged with the task of building God's temple. That's what we looked at Cyrus. That's what, how he's got this word from this commission from God himself that says, I want you to allow my people to go back, allow the vessels to go back. So we see that God cares about individual people. Remember last week we looked at that chapter two it has all these individual numbers and names. God sees you, he hears you, and he values you as an individual person. You're not just a number Honestly, you're not just a random vote. You're an actual soul that God sees and knows and cares about. And then the vessel or the people, the the vessels represent us as being connected with God, that we're the temple, that we are the, 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 the vessels that are being poured out as a drink offering to God. And so God uses us to accomplish his will. So he's bringing all that back, and they're going to charge build the temple. So we're going to get into that. They're going to build the temple, or maybe they will, maybe they won't. Who knows? The concept here today, when God says go... But the root has roadblocks. Now, I know you're confused. I know the kids are already confused. Kids, you know what Roblox is? Who, play, who plays Roblox? Yeah, yeah, No, not Roblox, but Roblox. It's, it's, they're, they're different things. And people who are older, 15, are like, I don't know what he's talking about. I play Roblox because I connect with my kids. It's pretty fun. But anyway, so we're not talking about the video game Roblox. We're talking about road blocks where God calls you to go, and yet you find strife and struggle, and it seems like the enemy is getting in the way. And I don't know if you've been there, but I've definitely been there, where God gives you an opportunity, and yet it gets so hard trying to get there or to do it that you're like, I don't know if, is God stopping me? Is this Satan stopping me? It's too confusing. I'll just go home. And stuff stops. And so we're going to see what God's going to do in this space. Um, and it's a bit about, it's a bit discouraging, right? In fact, today has kind of been a bit discouraging already, just with the, the people we're praying for and the sickness and the health that's there. But God has something in all this. So here, now when the seventh month came, the sons of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one person to Jerusalem. So they're coming together. Unity's happening. Yay. Then Jeshua, which is Basically, another word for Joshua. But at the Greek, you know what? You know, if you translate this to Greek, you know what that word is? Yeah, Jesus. All right? Now, don't read. It's not, that's not Jesus. Okay? We're not getting heretics here. But it's interesting that this guy is a priest. And he's going to fulfill the same thing Jesus does. He's going to try and connect people with God. And he's going to try and rebuild the temple. Just like Jesus said, I'm going to rebuild the temple. And so he actually ends up being this kind of Jesus figure along the way a little bit. And so you have this guy, uh, Jesus, uh, Yeshua, the son of jo- uh, Yozadak, and his brothers, the priests, and Zerubbabel, which is a, that's a cool-ass name, right? That's a, that, that guy's slick. He was popular in school, for sure. Zerubbabel, it's like he had a stutter. And I can say that because I'm a stutterer, okay? It's not offensive. 
Okay. Uh, so he, he's kind of the governor. So he's kind of the king. So you have the king. He's not a king because he's under the Persians at this time. So he's the, the governor of the area. And the priests joining together, the king and priests joined together to see God's kingdom come. The son of Shealtiel and his brothers rose up and built an altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it. And it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So what's happening here is they're going to hopefully start building the temple but in order to do that, they first build the altar, which was outside the temple. So if you look at back the old like uh, diagrams of the tabernacle and the temple, they had like this courtyard. And if you were Gentiles, you could kind of come here. Then if you were women, you could come here. And then if you were certain Jewish men, then you could come here. And then if you're a priest, you could come here. And it was like this whole hierarchical system. And so we're going to start doing that next week. So if you're, um, <laughs> women can sit there and the men can sit here. If you're pastors, you can sit here. No, I'm just kidding. Thankfully, we don't do that. But that's how that was. But in that, in, the inner, in this courtyard was the altar where they put the sacrifices on to ask for forgiveness of their sins. So if they'd done something wrong, instead of doing chores, or then they sacrificed their Joey the sheep, okay? It's just what it was back then, okay? That's how it was. And so they set this up. Why do they have, why do they set up the altar? That's a good question. That's kind of matter. Why do they do that before the temple? And so they set this up. Why do they do that? So they set up the altar on its foundation because they were terrified of the peoples of the land. Have you ever been scared? Kids, have you ever been scared? I get scared of a lot of things. Spiders, dark, being in a room by myself. <laughs> being in a room with too many people. I'm pretty specific, okay? <laughs> I get scared. And so what they do here is they, they create the space where they can worship God in spite of the fear that they're in around them. The altar was the place that they go to worship God. So they brought the offerings to just, I'm going to worship God for fun today. Or I got my sin. I've got this guilt. I'm going to go and bring it up before the Lord so I can be right with God so I can worship God in peace. And they built this foundation, they built the altar because they were terrified of the people and they burnt offerings morning and evening. Going to church morning and night. Let's go, amen. <laughs> what do you do when you're afraid with the fear that you have right now? I can tell you what you probably do is you probably worry a lot and stress a lot and you plan around it and you work A to B to make sure I can stop that from happening, right? That's just kind of human nature. I mean, God gave us a brain. I, I, I'm driving. I see a cop on the side of the road. I might already be going to speed limit, but all of a sudden, I'm afraid. <laughs> Break. And then you get a ticket for going too slow. You know, you just can't win. And uh, so, like, but fear drives us to action. But Jesus invites us to come to him with our fear and to worship in that space. Our soul is, we don't really talk about our soul that much or try and connect intentionally with our soul, but our soul is designed for eternity. Our soul, somehow deep inside, everyone knows, deep down in their heart, knows there's a God, that they're not the God, and that their soul is going to live forever, for eternity. It was made to be in a relationship with God. And worship does that. It brings our soul into this relationship with Jesus. And it, I believe that worship is a catalyst for transformation. Catalyst is kind of a, a weird terminology, but it's like a, a binding of our transformation. So I could go through an experience. I might be excited. I might be afraid, but until I connect that with Jesus and I'm worshiping Jesus, then it's just kind of a moment. It's just kind of a feeling that doesn't go anywhere. But like, if I want to grow in my relation with Jesus, you cannot do that without worship. I could turn this into a Bible college lecture and y'all would have a lot of fun. And we could go through, here's the qualities of God. Just one, two, three, four, write it down, go home, right? You can know, but it doesn't mean you've been transformed. I can say, don't live in fear, and then you're going to go home, and you're going to live in fear. You have to come to Jesus with that. It's the only way it works. And so we're designed for worship to bring our fear to God and say, Lord, you know, I'm afraid of this, but I know you're bigger. My brain is telling me I'm scared, but my soul needs to be reminded that God is bigger than what I'm afraid of. And so we come to worship. Lord, we're surrounded by the enemy. We're just going to start worshiping. I was talking to someone today. I didn't get their permission. I wanted to call them out and bring them up here, but I won't do that. 
because then you'll be scared and no one will ever come back to church again. <laughs> so I won't set that precedent. But I was just, the story was amazing. I won't go into details because I didn't get permission. But just that they were like, man, I was afraid for this really scary situation years ago that I, I was about to lose my life. I'm just afraid. And we just worshiped. We just worshiped and we worshiped. I'm like, man, what a testimony. You're like, you're planning your own funeral and you're like, we're going to worship God. Not in denial. I'm not like, well, I won't die if I worship God. It's, I am nothing else, so I might as well connect with Jesus. I mean, what a way to go too, right? How, what were you doing when you got to heaven? Well, I was worshiping. And all of a sudden, it takes the sting out of death. It takes the fear out of whatever it may be. I'm going to worship. I got a tough meeting next week. If, uh, if you have a tough meeting next week and you're like, man, I don't know if I'll get my job. Well, we're going to worship. I don't know what this is going to happen next, but we're going to worship. We're going to worship Jesus in spite of our fear. Now, you might be thinking, well, Kevin, I'm not afraid of anything. Well, aren't you just a big boy, aren't you? I'm not afraid of stuff. Well, you know what? You should be. <laughs> that sounded pretty dark, actually, like Darth Vader. You should be. <clears throat> if you are not in a place in your life where you're not regularly encountering fear, then are you where God is calling you to be? Our motto of just take the next step. If you're following God and you're taking that next step, there's no way you're not encountering fear on the regular. You have to be. This is what it is. It's what following Jesus is. It's, a, it's scary. And so we, which is great because it drives me back to worship, right? So if God's like, hey, I want you to move to Africa. Well, that seems pretty scary. Great. God's inviting you to worship him in your scariness. Maybe you want to go to Africa and God's like, I want you to stay in Gimpy. Maybe that's scary. Hey, we're going to worship God there anyway. I don't know what it is. We're worshiping God along the way. So if we're not regular in acting with our fear, our fear will overcome us or we go the other way. And I think Satan wants to do this. I think we honestly live in a way where Satan wants to get us so comfortable, so relaxed that we just kind of become numb with, hey, I'm going to keep binge watching my shows. And I love shows just like everybody else. I mean, I like that. I'm just going to doom scroll and just... And I'll, I get caught in that too. Like, but I'm saying, if we live in such a world that I get comfortable, that I'm never interacting with fear, then Satan wins. Because he knows that when I'm surrendering my fear to Jesus, I'm transformed through my worship. So they burn, off, they burn offerings. They built this despite being afraid of the people. It wasn't like, all right, let's get the walls built, guys. Let's build the cannons. Let's build the catapults. Well, let's build something to sacrifice people stuff on to worship God. They also celebrated the Feast of Booths, that is written, offered the prescribed number of burnt offerings daily. Okay, that's interesting. We offered the exact number we should, according to the ordinance, as each day required. This is so, this is so, 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 this is exactly us as Christians, right? All right, we're going to worship God, and we're going to do it exactly the way we're supposed to. No more, no less. We will turn it into legalism. and we will. Now, this is good. Like, they're doing what God wanted them to do. Which, but you could just sense it, right? You can see it just kind of oozing off the page a little bit. This was prescribed this way. <laughs> and we did it as was required this way. And what we're going to see is, although that's fine, there's not sin right there right now. We're, we're not really seeing God here or Jesus here. What we're seeing is we're following the commands, exactly how God wanted. And you fast forward 400 years when Jesus shows up and they've perfected this. That they don't need God anymore because we've got our systems in place. And so there's got to be careful with that. You've got to be careful. That, all right, every time I'm afraid, I put on this song, deal with that. Well, I don't need Jesus anymore. And, and it's so easy for us to miss Jesus even when we're trying to worship Jesus. So that's okay, but we're going to see it's going to end up becoming a problem later on. From the first day of the seventh month, they began offering burnt offerings to the Lord, but contrasting conjunctions. I know you're not an English, tomorrow's English, but welcome to church. But, so like, hey, that was good. We built the altar, but what was God calling them to do? Hey, what, a, what about the temple? That's what, like, because I want to be with you, and that, in order for that to happen, I'm going to live in that temple. That's how I'm choosing to do it. Nowadays, he lives within us as Christians. Praise the Lord. But the foundation of the temple had not been laid. So we see a problem in the story. Okay, you got the fear. You're connected with Jesus. Great. But if our whole Christian walk is just overcoming my fear and not actually being obedient to the Lord, then you're going to miss your step. You'll be a very calm Christian, but not accomplishing much for God's kingdom. 
God's given them the mandate. What are they going to do with that? I'm going to open up my Bible here for a second here. You know, um, that verse in the Bible that God talks about, he's like, I want obedience is better than sacrifice. It's easy to sacrifice, but it's hard to be really obedient. Now, they were being obedient with the legalism. We're following the prescripted rules of the law of Moses, and we're offering the exact amount of birds and fish and whatever. But if I'm devoid about my relationship with Jesus, he's called me to go and do this, then they're going to be missing out here. And the reality is it's hard to worship if you're not actually walking in obedience with what God's calling you to do. And so we're going to see here in this challenge, we also have a struggle with uh, worship because I found, at least in my life, there's an enormous privilege and joy in worshiping God in the obedience. Because when you're walking in obedience, it actually creates a lot of other issues. Like, Lord, I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know if it's worth the sacrifice being obedient to you. There's these questions I have to interact with God. Kids, have you had your parents ever say, go do this? And you're like, why? Right? It creates that conflict. Obedience is it's hard sometimes. Obedience is costly. It costs you something. Yesterday I had a pretty fun, funny conversation with, and, uh, where I had a conversation with someone in my life. And I said, hey, we're going to do some chores today. They weren't overly excited about that. They said, how do I get out of doing chores later? And I said, easy. You can do the chores now. <laughs> And they're like, okay, sounds good. I, I know, I'm an amazing, I know, I know. I'm an amazing parent, what can I say? No, that's just lucky. I just got like, thank you so much, kid, for doing the, the chores. But there's, it creates this conflict, right, where I have to say, look, it's going to cost me something to be obedient, Lord. What do I, I don't know if I can pay that price. So you got to worship. I don't know if it's worth the cost. So worship. Lord, I don't know if it's going to end up, okay, am I going to be dead at the end of this? If I get out of the boat and walk on water, am I going to drown? Well, I'm going to worship. It's so cool about that story with Peter walking on water because he gets back. I know I've said this, I think, before a couple of years ago. He gets back in the boat, and you know what it says about all the disciples? There was 12 disciples in the boat there. You know what they did when Peter and Jesus got back in the boat? What did they do? Anyone know? They worshiped. And he's, but do you think there was a difference and the 11 disciples that stayed in the boat worshiping Jesus versus the one that actually got out, walked on water, started to fall, got rescued by Jesus, and then got to walk arm in arm, hand in hand, back into the boat with Jesus. Who do you think had a more transformative experience worshiping? It was the guy that got out of the boat, paid the cost, failed, embarrassed, and yet he met Jesus in a profound way. The others didn't. Someone's going to get out of the boat. So, but the foundation of the Lord had not been laid. God called them to build a temple. They built the altar, and they were doing that well. We were doing something very well that God didn't ask us to do. <laughs> that sounds like Christians, right? All right. Then they gave money to the mace. I'm going to skip over this. We'll go to the next one. This, well, no, that, sounds, that sounds like that's a bad precedent. What they'd done is they started to organize themselves to actually start building the temple. And so they started giving money to that building program to build the temple. This is where it would be a great spot for me to start raising funds and say, hey, we have a building campaign. You can give to that. But I won't do that, okay? I'm not going to bait and switch you, all right? We'll do that like next month. Okay, so now, now in the second year, so wait. The first, it was seven months. The first, that, first, that first chapter was seven months. Now we've skipped to two years. What's going on? All that time. No temple yet? What's going on? And we have, somehow they got sucked into this sense of almost being lazy. And we're going to look, if you want to read for next week, Haggai, the prophet Haggai. He shows up, he's like, hold on guys. He shows up in those two years and says, I got a word from the Lord for you. That's pretty cool. I won't spoil it. You can read it for yourself. But then we'll look at it next week before we go into chapter 5. So in the second year uh, of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, I, the irony is there is no house of God there. Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jer same two guys, all who came from the captivity to Jerusalem began the work of the house of the Lord. Let's go. Praise the Lord. We're building the house of the Lord. They're finally doing what God's called them to do. They've gone, and they've, they're going, going, gone. And then what we're going to see is they're going to have some issues. We'll look at that in a second. 
Verse 10 says this. Now, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple, the priests stood in their apparel with their trumpets, the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals. Hey, there's a drummer showing up right there. Uh, to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. So they show up. They're going to, this is, turns into a worship service because they're doing what God's called them to do. And they sang, praising, giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good. For his favor is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great joy when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. They're doing God's work and they do it in such a way that they can show up and they can worship and they can celebrate. And notice what they're not celebrating, even though they're doing God's work. All right, I've got to put this in a different way. Let's say God called you to go rake your leaves. Now, I know we don't have much of a leaf problem in Gimby, but oh my goodness, in Utah, we had a leaf problem. And I didn't know at the time, but I was basically a slave, uh, an unpaid slave to my parents in raking leaves. I thought I was getting a good deal that if I raked uh, every pound, I would get paid five cents. Looking back, I can see that was a bit of a scam, but that's okay. When you're 11 and 13, that's all it is. So we're raking leaves, and there's just leaves. I mean, if you've seen pictures of America, like the fall leaves, they're pretty colors. Yeah, also a scam because those leaves die and they fall down to the ground. And then you got to rake up. So we're just raking bags and bags and bags of leaves. My dad's like, here's $2. I'm like, yay. <laughs> anyway, and so what am I doing with this? They're praising the God. They accomplished it. Here it is. Here's where I'm going with this. Is you get done with the job. And your instinct when you're doing God's work and you get it done well is to praise what the job you've done. Look how many leaves I've raked. I got bags of leaves. Some are filled with rocks because I knew how to play the system. Those wet leaves, worth a lot. And I look and look what I've done. Look at this lawn. Like every time I mow the lawn, I look at it like, the lawn looks good. And we miss Jesus in it. And I love what they've done here. They are They've laid, they're laying the foundation of the temple. And they're not like, man we, man, we measured that. Look at the work we did. They're like, look how faithful God is. And they worship him for who God is, not just for who they are. They look, look what God has done. He is good. Has he been good? Well, they've been in captivity for 70 years, so that says something, right? And this is what's so cool about God is he can bring up our past in such a way that we can worship him in our past. That means something because they've been in captivity. They haven't had the temple. The loss that they've had has generated a better worship experience. We're going to see how Satan's going to flip that later on. He has been good. Can you say that about your God for yourself? Like, I mean, I could say, that's a statement, but for you, when you say God is good, what does that mean to you? Because it's different for you than me. Because God has been, your story is different than mine. God has been good to you in different ways than he's been to me. When you say, man, God has been faithful. Has he been faithful in your life? Like that, that comes with some baggage, right? Like, man, I've been through some things and God is faithful. That's what, how do you get there versus saying a Bible college lecture, let me tell you about Jesus. He is good and he is faithful. You convinced? <laughs> versus you meet someone who's like, man, God is faithful. God is so good. In spite of me, in spite of my story, in spite of everything I've done to try and mess it up. He's been so, so good. How you get there is through worship. It makes a lasting change. The good, the bad, the ugly. I bring it all to Jesus and I'm worshiping him and it catalyzes those memories. It catalyzes in my soul where it starts producing fruit that can last a lifetime. So the foundation of the house was laid Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' households, the old men who had seen the first temple, so these are guys like Daniel, it's probably not Daniel, but people like him, who got taken from captivity, and 70 years later, or if they got taken like the third captivity, it's been like 50 years later, so some of these guys are maybe 60, they remember the old temple, got taken to captivity, watching it fall down, like when Roblox things explode and it, down goes the temple. They come back and look at them. They wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes while many shouted aloud for joy. They're not weeping sad. They're just overcome with emotion because they cannot believe that God in his faithfulness is bringing it back. 
And you see two different types of worship experience. You have the younger generation and the older generation. The older one was like, look what God is restoring. Look at the past that God is redeeming. And that's rich. And they're just overwhelmed by God's goodness, right? Some of our older people who've been praying a long time for God to work, and you finally start to see him work, it's meaningful. But the younger generation is like, look what God's doing. Look, this is new. This is exciting. Hey, we should put Ericon in the temple this time. Like, whatever it may be. And they're excited, which is good. And both generations are getting to worship God and celebrate God from different perspectives on the same event. So they shout out loud for joy so that people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people because the people were shouting with a loud shout and the sound was heard far away. There's, they, this worship party is going off and all they've done is laid the concrete. It's an exciting time to worship God. Everything's going well. That's how chapter 3 ends. And then the creepers come along. Kids, you know what? The, is that good when the creepers come or is that bad when the creepers come? That's bad news bears, right? Should have been on casual mode for sure. The creepers come along and they want to destroy everything you built. And so now we're going to look like, it seems like God's given the green light. The, the king is on board the priest is on board. The governor is on board. They're following the law of Moses. Literally everything that was wrong originally, everything is going well. And so then Satan comes along. He's like, nah, I don't like this. There's too much God going on in this place. Time to bring some disparaging, some discouragement, some dismay, devoid of Jesus. Let's bring all these D's into this place. So chapter 4, verse 1 starts off with, and this probably will apply to you. It's a lot of discouragement. Now, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's house and said to them, let us build with you, for like you, we seek your God, and we've been sacrificing to him since the days of Asahadam, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. Now, we already know these are bad dudes because the text told us. Now, if you read that by itself, you'd be like, hey, great, other people want to worship God too. But these guys, they know they're, bad. they're like creepers, just creeping along, trying to ruin God's work. And they see, and there's little, I think, subtles we can see here that they're like, we want to seek your God. Well, why is he not your God as well? I, I want to seek Kevin's God, but he's actually your God. So the fact that you don't claim to be your God is a problem. And we've been sacrificing to him, which actually, it's crazy if you go to parts of, uh, I, can't, I can't remember if it's in Jeremiah or Ezekiel. It's one of those two books that literally talks about people who stayed behind from the exile. God said, I'm going to take you into captivity and I want you all to go. No one's to stay. Those who stay are going to have plagues and swords and you're being disobedient. Hey, like kids when they're supposed to go on a timeout or be in trouble, and they're like, no. That doesn't go well. It doesn't get better from there, right? They're, so they refused the divine instruction from the Lord. And there was these people saying, hey, you've been gone for 70 years. We've been sacrificing to God the whole time. No, you haven't, because you never obeyed in the first place. And so... They respond, but Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the heads of fathers and households of Israel said to them, you have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will, will together build for the Lord God of Israel, just as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. So the first one we see is we have pretenders come along the way to try and join in. It's such a sneaky way the saint, wow, sorry. Such a sneaky way that Satan tries to get people off course is not to start with discouragement or start with barriers, but to start with fake allies that want to come along, but they don't have the same vision that God has, the same heart God has. I mean, I could give examples of certain types of Christians, well, not Christians, but people who think they're Christians, like, you know, JWs are Mormons. I've experienced with Mormons and like, hey, we worship the same God. Like, yeah, but do we? Not really. You think Jesus is a brother of Satan, like, and you think I can become God, like, Jesus. like, no, we, no, you, you know the name Jesus, but you don't worship Jesus like I do. It's a different God. Or hey, well, Jesus earned his way to heaven, just like you can earn your way to heaven. Yeah, you know what? Satan wants you to believe that because it's not true. It's not what the Bible says. Maybe it's just in business, right? If you, my business guys, have you ever been in a, you start a business with somebody and then it just goes pear shit because you have. You're worshiping different things. One's worshiping God and one's worshiping the business. It's not going to work. There's God or there's money, but you can't worship both. The Bible says that. 
It becomes a lot of issues. And so there's pretenders that come along. Not that we should be weary or leery of people. We should welcome everybody in to worship God, but also have some discernment. Say, Lord, before I'm in bank in the farm with this person, are they a like-minded person, Lord? Is this where you want me to ally myself? Like people getting married, our young people thinking about, hey, I like this person. I kind of like this person. Maybe we should, yeah, but if they don't have the core values as you, what are you doing? Uh, when I was working at the grocery store at HEB, there was a girl that uh, kind of liked me, and um, she was married, but, you know, that's who, whatever, not a problem nowadays. And so I remember this guy come up to me like, hey, dude, why don't you take her out? I was like, hey, she's married, and I was 18. And the second, I was like, she doesn't, she's not a Christian. She doesn't love Jesus. He's like, what does that have to do with anything? And not in a, I wasn't judging him. I just said, well, let me imagine this. Why do you wake up in the morning? Like, literally, why do you get out of bed? And he gave me some reason. I said, that the reason I get out of bed is to serve Jesus. And if someone else's reason to get out of bed is different, that's going to cause problems in every aspect of life. We might agree on our politics. We might agree on how we should serve. We might agree on what television show. Oh, they like the office. Well, I do too. Great. But guess what? When push comes to shove and you're through the discouragement and the dismay and the hard yards when the roadblocks come in, if you're not on with Jesus, if th- then why are you aligning yourself with that? You got to be careful because people pretend to want to follow Jesus just to be in a relationship with you. So you're like, Lord, are you fair dinkum? Only took me a decade to learn what that word means. But are you fair dinkum about this relationship with Jesus? So we can go, all right. So the first is pretending. Look at the second one. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building. The second thing Satan wants to do to stop you from going with God is he wants to discourage you. Not just a He wants to discourage you so much that you give up. That's his win. I mean, I've had a week. I, you know, one of those weeks, I have had a week, and it's been a load of discouragement, like just an oppressive amount of discouragement. I was telling her, I pray to you, I need prayer, because it's just this almost demonic level of oppression. Like, there's been some good things. Yay, someone got saved and loved the Lord. That's awesome, or this person happened. But it's like little bits of discouragement, and it piles on, and it's what Satan wants me to do is just to give up. It's just too hard, right? And it's not, discouragement is one of those things that it's not like, you need an equal amount of encouragement and discouragement. You could have like 10 amounts of, dis- of encouragement, but then you know what it's like to have that one amount of discouragement that kind of ruins the whole day. Your boss says 10 nice things, and then there's one thing, but you know, I don't really like your haircut. Or I don't really like your, jo- I don't like your, 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 I don't really like how you clock in. I don't like how you sweep the floor. I don't like your leadership style. I don't like this, this, and this, whatever, right? And that can, and that's something you remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I wasn't saying, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. It wasn't, I was not, it's just, that's what happens in my mind. Things come to my mind and I, anyway, we'll talk after. Um, so I had, but man, I had this level of discouragement that was getting off the charts. And then it, then what happens is if you don't go and worship Jesus in that, then it gets out of control. And this is what happened in my life this week is you start to then almost look for discouragement in other ways. And you start piling on, oh yeah, that's another one. Oh, that's another one. Woe is me. My life is terrible. Sucks to be Kevin. The J- Job where he's like, man, everyone who's born on my birthday, we're all cursed. You know, you got start to look for it. And you start to cling to that rather than cling to Jesus. I showed up at my, you know, my, my, my restaurant, Guzman and Gomez. They know me by name there now. <laughs> it is what it is. And this one arrogant guy shows up and he parks with his trailer and takes up six car spaces in what is arguably the busiest parking lot out of all of Gimpy, right? You got Maccas, you got Subway there, and now you got Georgia. It's absolutely crazy town. I'm just kind of, I'm already not having a good day, right? And I'm not happy with this guy because now I have to walk an extra 10 meters. <laughs> Woe is Kevin. And I get there, and I'm waiting for my order, and I'm, you know, they're like, oh, it's coming. And then another person comes in and gets their order and leaves. Another person comes in and gets the order and leaves. And I'm like, wow, what, wait a second. Woe is Kevin. And then I'm like, hey, I'm just wondering, I, have you forgotten about me? You know, Jesus hasn't forgotten about me, but Guzman Gomez will. And I said, uh, what's the, oh, like, oh, oops, we just gave that last person your tacos. So, Woe is me. Life is so bad. Now it's not really that bad, Kevin. Man up and start worshiping Jesus and get over it. Yeah, I'm driving home and I'm just like, I can't take this home with me, right? I can't be upset with my kids because I got my tacos later. I can't be upset with my kids because this guy had a trailer. And it's not their fault that this punk decided he was more important than everybody else in the world. I can't do that. I just got to worship Jesus, you know? And 
Or when the enemy has all these lies, Kevin, your ministry doesn't matter. No one cares about it. You're, you're not making a difference in people's lives. You're not good at this. You're garbage at this. Oh, by the way, you remember that time that you messed up 10 years ago? What about this? Like, and all these lies, he doesn't care about you. He just wants to get you off the path that Jesus wants you on, right? And so how are you going to do that? You got to worship. You got to worship Jesus because the brain is telling you, whether it's Satan or your own voice or whatever, these negative things, but your soul needs positive reinforcement. Not like, I am a good person, but your soul needs to be reminded of, it is well with my soul. Right, that song? You don't sing that song where you're like, it is well with my soul, like a celebration. You sing that song, you're like, man, it doesn't feel well. But I need you to remember that it's well. You need to remember that Jesus is on the throne. You need to remember that Jesus wins. You need to remember that Jesus sees you and vows you and loves you. He's a plan and a purpose. You need to remember that. And so for these guys, as they're being discouraged, man, you know, you're pretty bad temple builders. You're not really good at this thing. What you're good is at being in exile. You're good at your little house in Babylon. You're not good at this. You shouldn't do this. God doesn't have a plan for this. In fact, hey, you know what? Daniel said the Romans are going to come and conquer. All this, your building's literally going to be torn down. They need to go back and just worship Jesus and be reminded that God told them to build the temple. And so we're just going to do that. And we'll do it with joy. And so they were frightened, discouragement and frightened and they bribed advisors against them to frustrate their advice all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, which is multiple kings later. So we're talking about like a century, okay? Decades and decades of di constant discouragement and frustration and abandonment and all these issues. The red tape, you know? Probably less red tape back then there is now, <laughs> for sure. But just, so what do you do? It's not like, okay, I'll just get through this discouragement season next week and it'll be better. No. You need a plan to deal with discouragement on the regular. And which is great because that means I'm coming back to Jesus and worshiping him on the regular. Whether it's a fear or discouragement or dismay or frustration, all the days I will come to Jesus and worship him. And now the, the text takes an interesting big macro look. It takes, it's like zooming out of the one little part of your Roblox account, and it comes out to the whole world, and it says, now in the reign of Assyrius, you know who that guy was? Does anybody know who married that guy? Come on, someone knows. Let's see, a famous woman in the Bible that was around this time, Esther, that's right. Esther married King Assyrius. In the beginning of his reign, and they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So it's fast forwarded well into the future now. And the days of Artaxerxes, that's the guy after Esther, the next king, Bishlam, uh, we'll just, I remember this guy last time, we could just call him Meredith because it's easier, Tabil, and the rest of his colleagues wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the text of the letter was written in Aramaic, translated from Aramaic. And what does it mean? What is he doing this? This is a copy of the letter to which they sent to King Artaxerxes. So this is, again, a century later, but the same concept, the enemy's trying to shut them down. Your servants, the men of the region beyond the Euphrates River, which is Jerusalem, and now, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem. They are rebuilding the rebellious and evil city, and they are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. So not only is Satan going to try and bring pretenders, and he's going to bring discouragement, and he's going to bring frustration. He's going to literally try and shut you down by making you the enemy of the world around you. And so look what, look what he does here. He brings up the past sins of them. And this is what, exactly what Satan does. They were building the rebellious city. You know, like at this point, it was 170 years ago, that city was really rebellious. That's who they are. Their forefathers, their fathers, they were rebellious people. So I made my, you know what my forefathers were known for? Heart attacks. That's what we're known for. 50-year-old, that, that your life's gone. And uh, we found out we've had this blood disease, and so we have to be on blood thinners and all this kind of stuff. But like, that's what's saying, hey, you know what? Your ministry's over in like 10 years, Kevin. That's what you should know. Satan wants us to remember our past and shut us down. Because if that's your identity, my mistakes, and who my parents were or who I was, then it kind of clogs up 
your ability and your capacity to serve the Lord with freedom because you're so worried about what happened back then. Just like you have to worship God for the future stuff, what you're fearful of, you know, I'm afraid of what's going to hap- happen in the future, or I'm dis- discouraged because what's not going to happen. I have to bring that to worship God. You have to do the same thing with the past. To bring that to Jesus, say, Lord Jesus, I, don't, I know you've forgiven me, and I want to praise you. And we've seen that in songs, and it's so good. This is what's so cool. All right, bear with me for one second. Satan wants to debilitate you with your past. Jesus doesn't want you to forget your past. He wants to elevate it through worship. This is why you've seen the songs like, I once was lost, but now I'm found. We don't just sing, I'm found, right? Like that would be okay. Hey, I'm found. I'm found. I can see. Well, that's great. Praise the Lord. But you know why it means so much more and why it's so profound? Because it starts with, I was lost. Like I'm taking my past to Jesus and he's not erasing it. He's not forgetting it. He's saying, guess what? This will elevate your worship experience. That probably is not the right word to use. This will elevate your transformation because you're seeing how far you've come and then you appreciate me all the more. I once was lost. I mean, you don't know. I was blind. And now I see, and you can see the spectrum what God's done and the full capacity he's had in my life. Praise the Lord. I was a stutterer, and now I get to preach. I don't get to say, I get to preach. Don't forget the past. So this is where they could say, yeah, get, we were rebellious. And guess what? He's building his temple again. Praise the Lord. Let's sing again. And you've taken literally what Satan wants you to use as negative, and you flip it around and say, Satan, bring some more, because all I'm going to do is keep worshiping Jesus some more. Pull up a chair, Satan, join, the, well, jo- join me in praising Jesus. Let's go. We've got to think differently. We have to think differently in how we worship. We have to think differently through our trouble and our trials and our discouragement. We've got to think differently about our past. Yes, Lord, I, I, I wasn't walking with you for the first 40 years of my life, but look where I am now. Or Lord, my, Lord, I had some failed marriages or we had some, I had kids were off the rails, but look where you're doing now. Lord, I've lost my job, but look what I'm doing now. I messed up. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So now let it be known to the king that the city is rebuilt and the walls are finished. Because, so this is after Nehemiah has come, right? They've, they've done the whole thing. They will not pay tribute, custom tax, or toll, and it will be detrimental to the revenue of the kings. And they buy into this lie, which is, you see this lie, it's so around in the whole process of our world, which is don't let Christians be Christians because it will be a detriment to the country. It will be a detriment to the king, right? And so let's push Christians away because their agenda won't, contribute to the wealth of the nation. And that's actually not true. You look at nations who have loved Jesus and followed God have actually been quite prosperous because God, it's amazing when you live by Christian principles, <laughs> you're not killing each other and you're, you're growing up families who love Jesus and you're worshiping Jesus. He blesses those nations. But Satan wants the country to believe, hey, if we allow those Christians to do what they want to do, then that means we're not going to get what we want. And so it looks like we're hurtful to people, but we're not. We're not a people that want to hurt we are bringing dis- uh, and a disadvantage to our countries. Now, because we are in the service of the palace, it is not fitting for us to see the king's shame. For this reason, we have sent word and informed the king. So the king looks back. He does a search to see if it's true. Was that city actually rebellious? Imagine going, like someone going to your boss and be like, you should look into his history because he's a really bad dude. That, oh man, this is rough, right? And you will discover in the record books and learn that the city is a rebellious city and detrimental to the kings. If you look back at Kevin's life, you'll see he was lost. He was blind. He still is, basically, honestly. I, I have, without these, I can't see a thing. So we're still there, but anyway. Spiritually, not blind. God, what are you doing? So they revolted with it, they revolted with it in past days. For this reason, the city was laid waste. Don't make use of their life. Satan's like, don't make use of your life because it's going to ruin the things around you. It's just a lie. It's not true. We are informing the king that the city is rebuilt and the walls are finished. Then as a result, you will have no possession of those beyond the Euphrates River. So a decree has been issued by me and a search has been conducted and it has been discovered. Oh, your past is your past. Yeah, if you look back, Kevin's past is pretty, pretty dodgy. There's some things that don't line up with Jesus. And then you know what I get to do? Every Sunday I get to come and praise the Lord that he's forgiven me, that he set me free that that is not my identity anymore. And I pray that's for you as well. 
So they discovered that the city has risen against the kings of the past and that rebellion and revolt has been perpetrated again. So now issue a decree to make these men stop work. So the government says they are not allowed to do what God wants them to do anymore. So the city will not be rebuilt. Be aware of being negligent in carrying out this matter. Why should there be great damage to the detriment of kings? This is how the chapter ends, by the way. Then as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes' decree was read before Rehuman and Shishman, Shimshay, the scribe and their colleagues, they went, to a hur- went in a hurry to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by military force. Imagine you're like, oh, all right, Monday I got to do this for the Lord. Got to go plant some tomatoes. All of a sudden, rawr, 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 c- sirens come on like, no, you're not allowed to do that. Now I know as Christians in this room, you're like, yeah, but I'd do it anyway. Really? Are you going to go to jail over tomatoes? <clears throat> Probably not. I don't know if you need to, though, either. We see in this chapter that God sovereignly basically has allowed the progress to stop on his agenda there. And I want to tell some of you who are probably in such a situation, you're like, Lord, I want to go. I'm ready. You've opened these doors. Why am I still stuck that I can't get there? Sometimes that's okay by not Still pursue, I gotta be careful when I say, I want you to pursue what God's called you to do. But sometimes as you pursue it, he's put roadblocks there that actually stop you from going for a moment. And at that moment, that's okay. You're not being disobedient. It's just, it is what it is. When I wanted to come to Australia in 2010, I had the job interview in 40s and a t-shirt on the beach. I thought that's how all interviews went in Australia. It was just at the beach. Found out later, no, that was different. That was kind of weird, but whatever. And I was ready to come down that next month. Like, I'm ready to go. And it took 13 months for my visa to come in. And I thought, this is back when I was 22, the prime of life. Like, Lord, I got all this energy. I just got out of uni. I got all this head knowledge. I can't wait to just dump on people. <laughs> I can't wait to do this thing. I want to change, I want to, you know, change people's lives. Lord, I want to serve you. Let's go to Australia. And he was like, no. Like, the government literally was like, no, you can't come in. Well, Kevin, you should just sneak in, swim over, get one of the boats and come over. Come over. Do whatever it is, follow God. Well, I can follow God, but sometimes he stops. And sometimes he stops because he has other things he wants to work on, like your character or your soul. Or he's lining up other things, and the timing's not quite right. God's timing matters. He cares about timing. Like there's three days that were pretty hard for the, for, uh, the, the 12 disciples, right? Jesus was gone for three days. Kind of important things are happening. Or when God tells them, don't go out to the whole world yet, you will, but wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And they had to wait. Sometimes God calls us to wait. It doesn't mean you're being disobedient, even though you're not able to accomplish the main calling yet. But he will open the door when he's ready. He'll do it. And so what do you do? You just got to worship Jesus. And that's hard because you're like, Lord, I was so looking forward to this. And I'm just stuck. And for me, I was even then trying to get involved in other things. I had this car crash, and so God took away the car, took away the opportunity to go. I was literally stuck at home playing Roblox all day, every day. I know some of y'all kids are like, that's amazing. Eh, it gets old pretty quick. It's super fun serving the Lord. So I encourage you kids to, hey, we've had this time over holidays playing Roblox, but let's, tomorrow, let's get back into school. Let's start serving the Lord. Let's start going after Jesus. And eventually he opened the door for me to come and the timing was right. And I had matured. I had to learn some things and God opens those doors. So that just stops. Then the work of the house of God in Jerusalem was discontinued and it stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. It stopped for a, a long time. It stopped for a while. And what we're going to look at next week, why Haggai's message is so important to them. And why Haggai comes along and says, okay, hey, God stopped, but it's... Let's start stoking the fire. And we get trapped in this, oh, well, God says no, so then I get so comfortable that I stop ever trying anymore. And we're going to look at that next week. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for today, and I thank you, Lord, that you're a God who meets us every step of the way. Lord, that you've called us on this journey, uh, and along the journey, it's not about accomplishing the task. The job isn't, have I fulfilled this ministry? Have I done this task? But Lord, am I worshiping Jesus on the way? That's what you care about my heart and my soul being transformed in the image of your son. And sometimes it happens really quickly. Sometimes it happens slowly. Sometimes it happens when I'm doing your work. Sometimes it happens when I'm just stuck and you've blocked the road. 
But Lord, I pray you'll give us the divine wisdom and discernment to know what is a roadblock from you and what are the lies of Satan, that we don't listen to the discouragement, we don't listen about the past, but we take those, the fear, the stress, the anxiety, the past, we take that all to you in our worship and say, Jesus, Lord, I was blind, but now I see because of Jesus. He has been so good. He is so faithful. And Lord, we look forward in, in advance to this next week. Lord, you're going to be so good again. And you're going to be so faithful again until we meet again till next Sunday. I pray you will be that to Lord. Just show these people yourself. Help them withstand the attacks of the enemy. And they may worship Jesus from Monday to Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.